Hi friends, welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus Adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. 1st April 1948. At last the vehicle arrived. The time for our farewells had come. Another firm handshake with Paulus. Till we meet again in Germany. The vehicle rolled out of the gate. From Termolino, the journey went straight through Moscow and past the White Russian station. Was this not the road to Krasnogorsk? Yes, it was. In the camp that was so well known to us, we met many of our friends from the National Committee again. They had been brought there from Suzval and Voikovo. We would all be making the journey home together. Before that, we still had the opportunity to take part on a course organized by the Anti-Fascist School 27. At the center point of the teaching plan stood questions on history, Marxist-Leninist philosophy and political economy, as well as the democratic new organization of Germany. For me, this was a worthwhile deepening and rounding off of my knowledge that I had predominantly acquired by self-study. Added to this were excursions to Moscow, to the Museum of the Revolution, to the Tretyakov Gallery, to the theater, and to Gorky Park. Unfortunately, at the end of April, a painful inflammation of the nerves in my left arm obliged me to give up the course and go into hospital. I was kept in for weeks. Specialists in Krasnogorsk and one of the Moscow Poly clinics tended to me. I remember with gratitude the senior lady doctor from Krasnogorsk, Magnitova, who gave her first name. She not only looked after my health carefully, she also gave me courage and confidence whenever I expressed doubts whether I would be fit enough for the journey home. Keep calm, she said. You will not miss the transport, especially since the little grandchild is waiting for his grandpa. This lady doctor had done a lot of good for the German prisoners of war. She was generally revered as the Angel of Krasnogorsk. She saw to it that I received special treatment from the Moscow doctors. It worked, and by the end of June I was able to be released as cured and to return to my comrades in the barracks. During my stay in the hospital, I had seen among the German newspapers that I was given to read an occasional copy of the National Zeitung. In a June number was the news that two new political parties had been founded in the Soviet zone, the Democratic Farmers Party of Germany and the National Democratic German Party. To date, writing more than 15 years later, I can still recall the content and language of the program explanations of the National Democratic Party. On the 10th September, the vehicles were ready to take us to the Belarusian station in Moscow. Happily, we shook the hands of the Soviet officers and soldiers. Even Magnitova, so highly esteemed with her snow-white hair, appeared to wish us a happy return home. The train went too slowly, it seemed to creep over the tracks. At last we reached Brest-Litovsk, and after seemingly endlessly appearing days, we finally crossed over the Oder Bridge at Frankfurt and Der Oder. We were back in Germany. It was a newly arisen Germany that I was entering after six years of absence. And I, the former colonel and bearer of the Knight's Cross, who had once fallen on other countries with Hitler's army, had become a new person, a determined fighter for peace. While I was still a prisoner of war, the thoughts had ripened within me about starting anew at the place where I had belonged in 1939, Dresden. Often, I had pictured the world-famous silhouette of the Elbe city, with George Bohr's powerful dome, the slender bell tower of Chiaveri's court church and the needle pointed castle tower. What could have remained of them after the bombing in February 1945? How were the Zwinger, the opera, the Brolchik Terrace, the Japanese palace and all the many other architectural jewels that I loved so much? I was close to tears when I saw the rubble. It was just like the ruined city on the Volga in 1942-43. Could I ever be happy again in this desolation? I could. Almost unnoticeably, but nevertheless decisively, new life was thrusting its way through the rubble, at first very slowly, but constantly gaining ground. The rebuilt theater had already celebrated its opening. Dresden was the most important place in my work for a new Germany. First of all, I applied for a position in the Saxon Ministry of Education. At the same time, I pressed through what I had learned through the National Committee Freies Deutschland to become involved in immediate political work. I connected with the National Democratic German Party, whose newspaper, National Zeitung, I had already taken note of during my captivity. 
In the autumn of 1949, I became chairman of the NDGP Saxon Federation. I could already demonstrate in my political work that I had become a conscientious citizen of our German Democratic Republic. I grew in confidence, and with the confidence came ever larger tasks. As a consequence of the elections in the autumn of 1950, I became a member of the East German Parliament and Minister of Finance in the Saxon County Government. The transition of the German Democratic Republic into the socialist stage of its development demanded a basic reconstruction of the structure and the working system of the state organs. In the course of these changes, the former division into counties went, and with it also my function as Minister of a County Government. Then came a new, larger proof of confidence, the call to Berlin to the staff of the People's Barak Police in August 1952, with which I was involved for one and a quarter years. At the beginning of October 1953, my superior, Minister of the Interior Willy Stoff, said in passing, Paulus is coming back in a few days' time. He's going to live in Dresden. At the same time, I must ask the question whether you are prepared to take over the Officers' Academy in Dresden. The Academy for Officers of the Barak Police and in my beloved Dresden where Paulus would be living in the future. It could not have been better. I agreed immediately. I also remained in this function when, after the formation of the National People's Army in January 1956, the Dresden Training Establishment became the Academy for Officers of the National People's Army. A high point in the work and life of the Academy was the first big parade on Marx Engels Platz in Berlin on International Workers Fighting Day, the 1st May 1956. On that sunny morning, I had the high honor of leading our officers and officer cadets past the highest representatives of the new Germany, hundreds of distinguished anti-fascist resistance fighters, and many foreign delegations. Upon the conclusion of my 65th year on the 31st March 1958, I retired from active service in the National People's Army. A lot of nonsense was written about Paulus' return in the West German newspapers. He arrived at the Ausbahnhof station in Berlin on the Blue Express accompanied by several enigmatic commissars. He had a mysterious task from Stalin, carrying with him a manuscript that declared the invincibility of the Soviet Union in deterring the aggressive intentions of the Western powers. Not all of the nonsense was true. Paulus came simply as a returnee, upon whom Germany's catastrophic war had been a heavy burden. He came as a person who wanted to make things good again. After his warm reception in the capital by the Minister of the Interior, I escorted Friedrich Paulus to Dresden on the 25th October 1953, where he occupied a house on the Weissenhirsch. Naturally, the winter battle on the Volga was our main topic of conversation. It has not been easy for me over the past year, said Paulus. However, I believe I have drawn the right conclusions. Please read my declaration, which I issued upon leaving the Soviet Union. He handed me a document that I read with growing pleasure, although it contained a sober, well-thought-out decision. As leader of the German troops in the Battle of Stalingrad, so fateful for my fatherland, I have learnt down to the roots about all the horrors of the War of Conquest, not only for the Soviet people we fell upon, but also for my own soldiers. The lessons of my own experience, as well as those learnt during the course of the whole World War, have led me to the knowledge that the fate of the German people cannot be formed from thoughts of power, but rather from a lasting friendship with the Soviet Union as well as with all peace-loving peoples. Therefore, it seems to me that thoughts of peaceful war agreements also being pursued in the West are not the only suitable means for a peaceful reconstruction of German unity and ensuring peace in Europe. Through these agreements, much more dangerous would be the increasing and prolonging of the division of Germany. I am therefore convinced that the only real way to a friendly reunification of Germany and a progression to peace can only be achieved by a peace treaty on the basis of the Soviet note to the Western powers on the German question of the 15th August of this year. Therefore, I have also decided, after returning to my homeland, to put all my strength in cooperating to achieve the honorable goal of a peaceful reunification of Germany and the friendship of the German people with the Soviet people as well as with all other peace-loving peoples. I do not want to leave the Soviet Union without saying to the Soviet people that I once came in blind obedience as an enemy of your country, but now I am leaving it as a friend of your country. Our officers had passed to me a request for Friedrich Paulus to give a lecture at the academy on the battle on the Volga. 
In the course of a visit, I brought him this request and added that two days had been set aside for it in May 1954. He was immediately in agreement and soon set to work on it. He prepared sketch maps from memory and on the basis of notes that we had made in the first year of our captivity after talks with generals and staff officers. At the end of April, he invited me to visit him. We talked about his thoughts in broad outline. I asked him too if his lecture dealt with the reasons for the German defeat. Of course, he said. I think something along these lines, the main reason for the German catastrophe at Stalingrad, as for the whole disastrous course of the war, lay in the fable underestimation of the Soviet Union by the German Army High Command and the over-evaluation of its own possibilities. The German war leadership followed adventurous and rapacious aims. They thought that the Soviet state would fall apart under the blows of the German Wehrmacht. But it showed, despite the worst tests, an unprecedented steadfastness. The Soviet commanders demonstrated high military competence and the soldiers of the Soviet army defended their homeland with amazing tenacity and bravery as it stood unshakably behind them and delivered them ever more and ever better weapons. That is how the Soviet high command's plans for the Stalingrad battle could run like clockwork and lead to a basic change in the course of the Second World War. I could only confirm this appraisal. You remember how we crossed the Don in August 1944. We knew that a hard battle awaited us. However, no one believed that the Red Army would defend itself with such determination and ferocity. Where did the enemy soldiers and officers get their strength? We could find no satisfactory answer at the time. Only in captivity did the veil lift from these secrets. We got to know what socialism and communism meant to these people. For hundreds of years it was suppressed, deprived and trampled on. In October 1917 the hour of freedom hit them. To us much of what was happening in the East seemed incomprehensible. The Soviet people on the other hand knew what they had, why they were superior to us. They knew what they were fighting and dying for. I can understand, said Paulus, how today in West Germany these simple truths are denied by the generals despite their own experiences. However, we must let the whole world know and finally understand that the future of the German people must be based not on might and power, but rather on friendship with all peace-loving peoples, especially the Soviet Union. The one-time simple soldier had learnt to view world events through political eyes, from the man who previously had to resolve the conflict between orders and knowledge and obedience to senseless orders, a political person had emerged who was willing to commit his strength and knowledge to the prevention of war and the peaceful reunification of Germany. This was also detected by the officers of the high school, among whom Friedrich Paulus was neither enhanced by nor blamed for his description of the battle. He concluded his presentation with the words, all peace-loving people can only be horrified that today in West Germany a policy is being followed that has the same dangerous side to it as the previous history of the Second World War. The Paris and Bonn agreements are leading the Federal Republic along the same paths that led in the Second World War to Stalingrad and then ended in a national catastrophe. This made a deep impression, and many were obliged to revise their former skeptical condemnation of Paulus as a man, Fully in the spirit of his Dresden lecture, Paulus then turned to an international press conference in Berlin on the 2nd July 1954, which was conducted against the so-called Politics of the Strong by Professor Albert Norton. Among other things, he said, Since my return to Germany last year, I have been impressed even more strongly that high-ranking American politicians and soldiers talk and work on the German question as if the Second World War had not even occurred although it ended with such a frightful defeat on German soil. But what strikes and moves me much more is the fact that in West Germany in the highest governmental positions, and also in the press and on the radio, exactly the same attitude is taken and esteemed about all lessons of the past renewing a policy of strength, representing and supporting a policy of preparing for war on German soil. Paulus was of the firm opinion that the German question must be resolved by negotiations between the Germans in the East and the West. The plans for the rearmament of West Germany and the inclusion of West German divisions in the NATO forces gave him no rest. On a Sunday morning towards the end of 1954, he told me that he had decided to make a speech to former officers of the German Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic. Numerous letters, especially from West Germany, had strongly reinforced him in his project. I was astonished how much work he had already done on it. 
I will make clear to the West German participants that the Paris agreements on the reunification of Germany prevent and deepen the division of Germany. I want to demonstrate that a policy of strength can no longer lead to success. We former officers must assist the Germans from here and there to understand each other. Do you believe that the former officers who have lived in West Germany since 1945 will go along with this argument? It will not be easy for them. Certainly they will bring up the old argument of the unpolitical officer about whom we often heard during captivity. I will then recall how we got there. It must be clear to the officer that through his unpolitical behavior, he became the greatest political tool. He must be subjective in dealing in good faith as we did at the Volga. By blind compliance with orders, we were objectively also guilty of criminal conduct. How unscrupulously did Hitler misuse our unpolitical attitude to the damage of the German people and to the shame of the German name? During these last words, Paulus had risen from his chair and strode off across the big room. Then he stopped, standing in front of me. That, my dear Adam, is what especially those former officers think that let them obtain the West German military contingent from the government of the Federal Republic. One day the German people will ask them the direct question. What did you do then for the unity and sovereignty of our fatherland? What have you done for peace? I reinforced Paulus in his thoughts. He nodded in agreement and picked up a sheet of paper. I want to conclude my discourse with an appeal to all the assembled comrades, including all other officers and soldiers in the East and West, to unite our fatherland. Don't be silent on those who must be involved in Germany's existence and future. It was an impressive experience when Friedrich Paulus spoke in Berlin on the 29th January 1955, after the sounds of the old German soldier's song, Which Hat Ein Kameraden, had accompanied our remembrances of the fallen former officers from East and West Germany. Most of them thought inwardly and vowed never again. I was convinced that many West German participants also made this vow. However, the number of inflexible Hitler generals who dipped their pens deep into the ink for their memoirs increased. The one that annoyed Paulus most of all was Manstein's book Verlorene Sea, Lost Victory. When I was with him again in the summer of 1956, he brought it out. This you must read yourself. According to what it says here, Manstein is completely blameless for the destruction of the Sixth Army. This man writes knowing the truth, but ascribes all the blame to me and Hitler. You yourself heard almost all the talks I had with him over the decimeter apparatus. You know how he kept back from me the true situation at the front and paralyzed my freedom of action. And now he prints all this, the former commander-in-chief of Army Group Don. He falsifies the facts to hide the real truth from our people. This man I once regarded highly. Now he lies with all the others who sail the old course away from their equal responsibility for the downfall of the Sticks Army, their equal responsibility for the war and its bitter end. As long as I live, I will try to negate this attempt to wash his hands of the business. Manstein, the Army High Command and the Wehrmacht High Command, and all of us who from the beginning approved and pursued Hitler's policies, or guilty of this misfortune. Anyone who has even a spark of honor in them must admit and tell the people the truth, so that we never again come to a Stalingrad. Paulus' late insights were especially valuable to our people. Spoken by a former expert on wars of conquest, today they belong to the foundation of a necessary turnaround in West German policy. Unfortunately, Paulus' health was getting worse. He often had to interrupt his work. His intention of writing a history of the battle on the Volga remained incomplete. On the 1st, February 1957, 14 years after the end of the great battle, he closed his eyes forever. I had lost a good friend and comrade. Painfully, I took my farewell of Friedrich Paulus, whose fate had been so closely entangled with mine for 15 decisive years of life. More than 20 years have now passed since that decisive battle on the Volga. Many of those who survived it are no longer with us. Those who at that time were in their prime of life are rapidly approaching the grave. And even the youngest survivors of the participants in that great winter battle are today close to 50 years old. Thus, the number of living witnesses to the German tragedy on the Volga are diminishing. Thus, all the more important are the written accounts and the works that contain their knowledge and experience. I am fortunate to be able to be in Germany as the new age breaks, the age of socialism. 
The way was not easy, and it will not be easy in the future. But the way was and is the right one. It is the only possible consequent alternative to the way of wars of conquest that came to an end on the Volga. Never again will a war start from German soil. No, never again may our fatherland raise the fury of war. Germany is not to become an atonic graveyard. All was and is to be done to establish a blooming German fatherland with an order of society that excludes imperial arbitrariness and military demons, an order of society that with the prosperity of its people enjoys national sovereignty and dignity, social equality and the friendship of other peoples, and an order of society that is firmly grounded. That is the bequest of the dead and the survivors of the frightful battle on the Volga. Dear friends, that's all for today. Please support my channel with any comment. Thanks a lot. It was Tim and see you.